Hey, Tegan. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? Good. Welcome to Scissor Tail Sessions. Thanks for having me. I'm so grateful that you uh, had some time to get me in. Absolutely. So I know you're running for Oklahoma's House District 95, and your election is November 5th, just like all the big elections. <laughs> Can you tell me about your district? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, our district is situated on the east side of the Oklahoma City metro area. Um, we contain the six square miles in the older parts of Midwest City. Um, and uh, when we get down to around Tinker Air Force Base, um, we kind of blossom out from there. So we have uh, Tinker Air Force Base in the land surrounding, and we have moved with redistricting a few years ago um, into northern Cleveland County. So our district represents, um, as far as cities go, Midwest City, Oklahoma City, and more. We are in both Oklahoma and Cleveland counties. We represent the districts of Middell, Crutcho, Oklahoma City Public Schools, Choctaw, Nakoma Park, and more. Did I say five there? I hope I, I caught them all. If I'm I missed not one, sure. I'm, I'm sure you got it right there. <laughs> um, we have about 49 square miles. Um, I live at the northwest portion of our district, and it takes me almost 40 minutes to get out to the southeast corner of the district. It is a lot of driving, for sure. That's incredible. And I noticed, was it two years ago when the district expanded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. Um, you know, they had an opportunity to bring more of Midwest City proper into our district. Um, the northeast corner of Midwest City is a great area full of really wonderful families and, um, you know, folks, just everyday folks who are just trying to get along. Um, but instead of bringing that part along and kind of keeping that cultural identity of Midwest City together, um, they pushed us down into some areas that are a little more red um, in Cleveland County, and um, the northeast portion of Midwest City has to vote with Choctaw in their district. Well, on that note, go ahead and tell me about your specific election November 5th, and what are you campaigning on? What are the important parts of your campaign? Sure. The, the first and foremost, um, I'm campaigning on the fact that we need to make sure that our elected officials are talking to us. And that is, first and foremost, the most important thing that any campaign should be focusing on is developing relationships with the people in the community. Because if you're not, you're not doing your job of listening to the needs in the community. Um, and so what I'm hearing and what I started hearing a lot whenever we first started door knocking this go round um, was that, you know, people felt like they hadn't been heard. Um, they had reached out to our current representative, sometimes numerous times. I actually had a lady who's inform me that she has reached out to our current representative over 50 times via email and phone call and has never once um, been responded to. So, um, and, and then that's a frequent thing that I'm hearing from people as well. Um, so that tells me that we are not being representative of our area. Um, so that was very important to me to make sure that I put the emphasis on being a public servant and not a politician. Um, and to segue into the big topic that I talk about a lot of times is um, you know, we, we like to say in the teaching profession that a teacher has a bag of tools, bag of tricks. And so when we're educated, working on our lesson or whatever and doing it in class, we pull out different techniques, different resources that we might be able to employ in the classroom because not every single child is going to respond to the way that feels easiest for us. Right. And same thing whenever it comes to doing this. Um, first and foremost, anyone who ever runs for office should be a public servant. And they should employ politics as a means periodically to get the things that they need when they're out working um, in the whatever, you know, the, the city council or the state house or the federal government, wherever they're working. Politics should come in during those times, never when you're trying to get people to help out in your community, never when you're standing on somebody's door. You know, politics has left a lot of people feeling like um, their needs aren't being met. And so that's why it's very paramount for me in that respect. Um, the big issue that we talk about frequently, and it does not matter what political party I'm speaking to, people are very fed up with the state of our, our public schools. Um, they are recognizing that we have had a few decades of cutting funding and underfunding and demonizing a profession and trying to make our schools look like they're failing and have done such a wonderful job that we're at the point where they're actually starting to just not be a usable institution anymore. And they are very uh, concerned about uh, who's at the helm at the State Department of Education. 
Um, I honestly, most times, if you just mention the state superintendent's name, the person on the door will drop their head and say, oh. And it's just that pause because there is a significant amount of distrust in what that person is doing with their position. They see it for what it is. They are playing politics with that spot and they're doing it on the backs of our children's education. And that's not okay. So um, we talk about public schools an awful lot. We all seem to recognize that making sure that they are properly funded, have adequate resources, and uh, just doing the things that we need to do to ensure our kids have the ability to choose a life path when there comes time for them to do so, that's going to enable them to be empowered to be in control of, of what they do with their own lives and not be, um, you know, reliant on, you know, um, the welfare things that we have to ensure that people uh, haven't fallen through the cracks really want to try to get back to that point where those systems are in place so people you know can rely on them when they have just a little hiccup in life instead of being forced into that spiral where they can't get out of that um, dependency so um yeah everything comes back to our education it really does and on mm -hmm. that note i think it's a good segue you did 14 years in public education and just got out not too long ago, and 10 were in Oklahoma schools. Can you speak on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, uh, I started teaching whenever my, my um, spouse was in the Air Force. We did uh, about 12 years away from Oklahoma, um, supporting um, the Air Force with their mission. Um, and uh, not long after he joined, I decided to go back. I had a bachelor's in liberal studies and decided to go back and um, go ahead and get my teaching certificate. Um, the, the original plan was to go to med school, but we were moving about every 18 months, and it just was not a feasible um, path for me at that time just because there would be no way we could keep our family together. So I pursued getting a post-baccalaureate teaching certificate and got my master's degree in pre-K um, through eight education. Um, I... Uh, I worked in a um, public school system in Mississippi down on the coast. It was actually one of the um, top five ranked schools in the entire state. It was a wonderful learning experience and a great place um, to have uh, some really wonderful mentor teachers. When we moved back to Oklahoma, I taught here in Middell at Pleasant Hill Elementary, um, then moved back to Moore, where we were living at the time for just a little bit, um, to teach at Fairview Elementary, and then... Um, Moved back to the Middell District to teach at uh, her middle school, which eventually changed over to Dell City Middle. So I um, have spent quite a bit of time doing um, various different subjects. Um, really found my, my niche where um, teaching leadership, communications, and advanced learning type courses at the middle school. Um, I know it takes a very special heart to be able to spend their days with middle schoolers. And um, it was a lot of fun most days. Um, stress was there just like it is with any other job, but uh, um, they they can be absolutely brilliant. And it was so wonderful to see those light bulbs go off frequently. Um, but yes, uh, stayed in school for um, a long time. And, and I feel like in a lot of ways, I've never really left. Um, even today, my husband and I run a company that help, we help people get their life safety um, uh, plans taken care of and get them through the certificate of occupancy process with any jurisdiction in the state. So um, it is a very uh, involved process and very confusing for a lot of people. So my teacher hat comes on frequently to make sure I can put the terms in usable dialect that people can actually understand and replicate at some point in time. And, and so they can actually get through the process without having some dings on, yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, that's awesome. And so, but on that note, on teaching... You got, you've been at it for, for, let's say, you did 14 years in public education. Um, can you speak to the evolution that you have seen when you started? How has teaching changed? Because I feel like it used to be a much um, more inviting career choice for people. And now, honestly, I don't hear of anyone going into education. And I'll be upfront, I did four years teaching in public education here. And um, it, it takes a servant's heart and it's very hard work and it's uh, very underappreciated um, when I experienced it. And so what what can you say to the changes you've seen from when you started to when you got out? Mm -hmm. 
when I first started teaching, you know, the the common complaint in the profession was that there's some new newfangled thing, newfangled theory, newfangled product that they're trying to get all the teachers around to um, buying into um, because it's going to raise test scores. That was that was when the the test score issue was really starting to become a very big deal. And so teachers, you know, anytime admin would bring a new thing to us, it was just an eye roll because we knew we'd been trained. We'd been um, given so many resources through our teacher preparation programs that we knew how to reach our students. We knew how to get out there. We knew how to teach the content. We knew how to really make those connections to empower our kids to take that education into their own hands and really fulfill that potential. And so what we have seen through that is that 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 natural progression from this is the new product that this company is trying to sell the entire education community into this is the product that's going to raise test scores. This is the way we need to evaluate teachers to make sure that they are creating little widgets that have the best test scores. And so everything that we've been seeing, at least for the last decade, has been all about test scores. And what any person who is in a classroom absolutely 100% knows is a test score, especially t- standardized tests, are nothing more than a reflection of the socioeconomic level of the area. You know, if we have a, a, a more impoverished area, those parents, bless their hearts, they are working overtime. They are working two and three jobs just to make sure that they have enough money to provide the basic necessities for their kids. So sometimes the kids are, um, you know, if, if they've got enough funding, they can send the kids to daycare or after school programs and things like that. Sometimes they don't have that access to that. So it's staying with grandparents or it's staying with siblings after school. I can't tell you how many children that I had even in, you know, middle school that were primary caregivers for their siblings because mom didn't get off work till 11 o'clock at night and she had to work because they couldn't afford groceries, you know. And um, I know teaching yourself that you've heard those stories. You know, my water got shut off, so we had to take our empty milk gallons to the gas station bathroom to go get water. Right. That that happens in our kids' lives every day. And, and, you know, I know Maslow's theory is not really, you know, the end-all, be-all, but it's a good way to start thinking about some things. And it does make a lot of sense, especially on those lower levels, that if your basic needs aren't being met, you're not going to thrive in other areas. And so we keep seeing those types of things, and it's just, gosh, it's heartbreaking to know what our families are experiencing and and how we really need to start focusing and making sure that people have access to those resources to make sure that we can get our kids started off on the right foot. You know, I Mm -hmm. can't tell people enough how important it is to read to your children an actual book before they enter kindergarten and do it numerous times. And show them how the words on the page work and not just their ABCs and the letter sounds, but just those little things that you don't remember learning yourself because you were so young. Those things, that seat time with a kid gives kids such a leap forward in so many ways. And when we see the more impoverished areas, we know that some of these kids just aren't getting that. And it sets them behind when they start school. And when they're behind when they start school, they stay behind until they get to a point where they take some responsibility for their own education. And I'm not saying that they don't do that ever, but right, they, right. you know, they, they, at some point in time, they've got to be like, yeah, man, I know they're trying with me and I see what they're trying to do now. And let's go get it. And that's usually something that happens in, you know, with kids about the late middle school, early high school, where they want to start driving the direction of the classes they take. They don't want mom picking up their schedule for them. And when we see those things, when we start bridging that gap in early childhood, we really do start to make a, a, a huge shift in what's happening in our classrooms. And not that necessarily we're going to see higher test scores, but we know that the kids, those neurons are making those connections in that brain. We might not see the results of the impact we've had bridging that gap, but we will see it eventually because those kids are going to do incredible and wonderful things to make their community proud. Exactly. And so yeah. I, I guess you really just believe it It probably starts at home, right? It would does. you say? Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I, as many parents as I have met over the years, most of them are absolutely wonderful. They are absolutely wonderful. Um, You know, sometimes they might not have had a great bringing up themselves, 
And so they try to make changes to make sure that their child has a better situation. Um, they, they really do work hard to make sure their kids' basic needs are met. Um, and then apart from that, you know, sometimes they didn't have that guidance when they were young, so they aren't able to give it. But a lot of them, a lot of parents that I have met are so receptive to any advice that, you know, an educator can give to help them, you know, bridge that gap and bring them up to where they need to be to be, and you know, on the level of their age group years. Because let's face it, we rank our kids by age group, and that's not always the best way to do it. But that's how we do it right now. And it's, you know, the, the, the parameters we have to work with them. So, yeah, it's we, we've got a lot of great things going on in our communities. We just have to find a way to bridge those gaps and help people get where they want to be. I definitely agree. I, I want to say I believe in my short experience in teaching that the parents in Oklahoma schools are fantastic and the parents care. And really, as parents and as residents of Oklahoma, we really need to build the public education system up to support those parents because the parents want to do the hard work. The system's yeah. just not there for them to do it. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. You know, I, I bring up frequently last year, um, Middell passed a bond election, and it, it was kind of unbelievable in a lot of ways because they were requesting a total of $452 million. It is by far the largest bond election that they've ever put to a vote of the people. And you know what's crazy about this, Jacqueline? Tell me. I had three questions on it. All three questions passed with greater than 70% approval. Our community loves and values our public schools. I knew that before that election happened. I know yeah. it even more now. And it's why I know in my heart that what I'm doing with this campaign and trying to champion for our public schools is the right thing to do. When we have, you know, strong public schools, the things that we see, the benefits we reap in our community alone are incredible. You know, our, our law enforcement officers have less issues to respond to. Our, you know, our, our anybody in public safety, I should say, actually has less stuff to respond to because that knowledge is there that, you know, you don't stick a fork in a light socket. You just yeah. don't do that. You don't do the X, Y, and Z because it's going to have these consequences for it. So, you know, making sure that we've got um, our kiddos taken care of, it's, it comes back and it traces back to every single thing that we see that's negative in our society right now. And I guess on that note, on November 5th, you are going against Max Wolfley, correct? That's correct. And you ran against him previously. I did. And you only lost, the margin was 778 votes was the margin. Is that correct? That's correct. And so that just shows how important these local elections are. It, yes, mm -hmm. the presidential election is important. Yes, the governor race is important in all the large state and national elections that we participate in, but the state ones on the small districts, those matter. Absolutely. Can you, you know that? And absolutely. just why it is so important that yeah. everyone gets out to vote on November 5th. E not even yeah. if they're voting for you, even if they're voting for Max, they're exercising their opportunity to have a voice. For sure. You know, um, when I knock doors and we've, I think our campaign, and I'd, I'd have to double check the exact number right now, but we should be getting close to having knocked about 14,000 doors by now. Wow. And we'll probably knock at least another thousand before election day. Um, but what we, what we know more than anything is, you know, people don't understand the impact that um, voting in your state and your municipal elections and your county elections, they have so much more of an impact on your day-to-day -day life. And what happens on the federal level? Um, people like to, then they get that confused when I show up sometimes at the door, which allows me to let my teacher come out again and, you know, just explain, you know, that the stuff that's happening on the federal level, yeah, both parties are failing miserably at making sure that people feel heard. They're failing miserably at making sure that um, people know that we come to the table to work together, not as a winner takes all. Um, whenever we have that winner takes all mentality, whether it be the federal government, the state government, or even our city governments, um, we, we don't get good government for some of our population. And if you're going to be elected into these positions, is you really need to make sure that you're being representative and hearing the needs of the people. You're not elected to go up there and impose your will on other people. You're there to represent your community's interests. So um, definitely making sure that you turn out for an election, um, no matter who you vote for, 
I'd also like to, you know, use the moment to say, hey, straight party ticket voting seems like a really good idea sometimes, but it's not. It absolutely isn't, you know. If we had a slate of, you know, Republicans in, in, in House District 95 that just, you know, from the top down on our ballot, they were incredible. And there was one out there that you just knew was going to be a dud because of whatever that you know, you know. Um, and you vote straight party ticket, you've just enabled a portion of our government to be handled by someone who is not capable of performing the function well. And so um, taking a stop, taking, just taking a step back and looking and say, you know, where do I get this information from? What can I do? There's tons of resources out there. Um, I like to tell people first and foremost, Google OK Voter Portal. It will bring you to the state's election website. It's got a wealth of information there, but the most important thing it has on there, especially right now, you can print off your PDF sample ballot, and it's specifically the one that you're going to see. When you step into an election um, booth, you're not allowed to look on your phone. It's against the law. You can get in trouble doing that, but you can take a piece of paper with you. And if you've already got your ballot and you've sat at home and you've looked up the videos and the the literature that's out about, you know, the state questions or about the judges we're, we're voting on or even the candidates that you've got on your ballot, if you look at their websites and their social media and start to get a feel for them and reach out to them too, talk to them, send them an email, call them on the phone, however you can get in touch with them. They want to hear from you or I'm going to rephrase that. They should want to talk to you. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, how do you handle this? How do you deal with people who you know are supporting your opponent. I knock their doors too, Jacqueline. And I do it for a specific reason. Because if I get elected, I don't want them to feel like um, that I'm going to shun them or I'm not going to listen to them or that they're less valuable to me in, in my eyes because they don't agree with me politically. They're human beings. They're members of my community. They have children here. They have offices here. They do all sorts of things in our community. Why wouldn't I want to listen to them? Why wouldn't I want to talk to them? So encouraging people, even if they're not voting for me, and hopefully they, they find something they like about me, but just encouraging people to get out there and cast that ballot, it means so much. And, you know, I, it's just like that Rush song. When you fail to choose to decide, you've still made a choice. Point blank. You've allowed other people to make the choice for you. And, you know, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes you might get into that, that spot. But we have had decades of the voter apathy here in Oklahoma. And something I know more than anything is we're not a red state. We're a state that doesn't vote well. There are a lot of people with, you know, a lot of different ideologies. Doesn't necessarily mean we're a blue state either. We're a very purple state in a lot of ways. We've got to find that common ground with one another. And we've got to start supporting each other because we have a good character, because we have this willingness to work and reach across the aisle. We have to take the time to make sure that we're meeting our needs. That's correct. And I want to go ahead and plug for everyone who's listening. I believe Monday is the last day to request an absentee ballot, but you can still request right now. People can log on to their computer and go ahead yeah. and request that ballot. Absolutely. And you know, the great thing about absentee ballots, um, you know, if you don't want to do anything else with it, except for just fill it out and mail it back in, you can do that, but it does require a notary signature. We do recommend that people put two stamps on it because the envelope is bigger and it does not just, you know, it, it needs two stamps. But you don't have to mail it back. You right. can actually fill out your absentee ballot. And right now, today, well, not today, but obviously during working hours, you can go to the county election board, whatever county you live in, and turn it in there. They will take it from you. Or you can go to early voting and turn your absentee ballot in there. Um, and the great thing about doing early voting, which I, you know, we've been talking to quite a few people who are, are aging and they didn't realize that this was a service they could do. If you have a placard on your car to um, accommodate a physical condition that you might have that necessitates, you know, shorter distances or things like that, um, whenever you go to early voting at the county election board, they actually have a drive through. So people who are not mobile who can't stand in line because sometimes in early voting, you have to stand in line for about three hours to get through. Um, then you can drive through. The election workers will bring your um, ballot out to you. They will give you the necessary things and check you off appropriately following all the protocols that they have and help those folks who just need that little assistance. So, you know, it's very important to remember that every single vote counts. 
every single one. Every, and every, one. every single yep. one, literally. And just because you might not be able to walk well anymore, or just because you just turned 18 and you're more concerned about your friends, every single vote counts. And these, these are the elections, these things, these decisions that are going to be made are going to affect your life for the next 20 years, at least, you know, unless you find somebody else to get into that office to change things. So um, it's very important to get involved, even if it's just a little bit and stay involved and, and hold your representatives accountable talk to them. That's all you got to do is just talk to them. Tegan, I've had a great time with you. Do you have any closing remarks that you want to say to your district? Is there any last message that you would love to get out there before November 5th? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my 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 time in Midwest City, because I am a Midwest City girl, started when Tinker was first being built. My family has been here since that time. We've supported the military through World War II, through Vietnam, through Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, and just, you know, being as civilians at a Tinker Air Force Base, we have contributed a lot into this community. And we have been happy to do that because there were so many other great people that we've been surrounded by who did that as well. We understand in our community this commitment to service and serving other people. But we also understand that that service comes with need. And if we're not meeting that need, um, then we've really got to, you know, hunker down a little bit more and find those things. So. Um, to everybody who lives not only in Midwest City, but the rest of House District 95, because, you know, I've, I've been all over it. Um, I've lived in, in other areas of it. I have recreated in other areas of it. I've worked in other areas of it. Um, we're a great community. And, you know, I, we've, we've been the feelings of fear and anger for so long that I've really love to see us come back together. We're not going to agree 100% of the time, maybe not even 50% of the time. But as long as we make that commitment to talk to one another and work together and uphold the ideals of democracy and commonality that we all share, I think we're going to be just fine. Just have to remember who we are and, and we're a community. And that entails so much love and so much good stuff that we just keep moving forward. So thank you for the opportunity, Jacqueline. I can't thank you enough. No, absolutely. And I hope everyone gets out to vote November 5th. And well, Tegan, thank you so much for joining me on Scissor Tail Sessions. Sure thing. Thank you very much.